Hello, welcome to the program. Tonight, an important breakthrough in the Henry Keogh case. Also tonight, the latest acne, acne treatment, I should say, working wonders for teenagers, and the worst television ads currently annoying viewers and raking in the complaints. But first tonight, there is no question it's very hard to have a murder conviction overturned, particularly when all the avenues of appeal have been blocked. But should it be impossible? Tonight, two of the country's most eminent legal figures join the growing ranks of lawyers and forensic experts, locally, interstate and internationally, who all agree that the prosecution of Henry Keogh for the murder of his fiancée, Anna Jane Cheney, simply doesn't stack up. And tonight, you can also have your say on whether the case deserves a properly independent review to see if Henry Keogh has already spent 11 years of a 25-year sentence behind bars for nothing. The argument that key forensic evidence has now been almost totally discredited, that the public has been left in the dark, or worse, misinformed about the true facts of the case. Here's Graham Archer with this special investigation. I would think that Keogh is not even a marginal case. I think it's a case that cries out, it begs to go back to the court and it begs to go back quickly. Just as a, uh, a good government is in favour of law and order, so it ought to be in favour of a good system of justice and not a system which allows uh, unjust convictions to stand unreversed. By now, most South Australians are aware that fundamental errors were made in the conviction of Henry Keogh. It is my view, and I said it at the trial, is that I don't think this case would have got to court in Victoria. And word of our apparent tolerance of shoddy justice has travelled well outside the state. Well, it seems to me as though there's been a significant miscarriage of justice. There's been evidence that's come to light that no one really knew that much about at the time of the trial which could well have uh, influenced the jury's verdict. And in cases such as that, I would have thought it's an appropriate case for it to go back and be redetermined by the Court of Criminal Appeal. Tom Percy and Malcolm McCusker are two of the nation's top QCs from the West, specialising in miscarriages of justice. Between them, they've overturned some of the country's worst injustices. The Button, Beamish, Christie, Mickelberg and Mallard cases being just some. They now see the Keogh case as almost certainly another. I think this is uh, at least as strong as any of the three recent, three or four recent cases in Western Australia where the convictions have been overturned. I think that uh, the evidence here uh, is exactly the sort of thing that would enable the court to have another look at it and I would think probably uh, overturn the verdict. Malcolm McCusker says what the jury weren't told about is enough alone to set aside Keogh's conviction. A scathing report on the scientific competence of key expert witness, pathologist Dr Colin Manock, over basic errors he made in not one but three previous baby death autopsies was withheld by the coroner until after Keogh's conviction. And they knew nothing they knew about, nothing about the, the coronial investigation. The coronial investigation, no, because it was kept under wraps. Indeed, the, the coroner said, as I have read, the coroner quite extraordinarily said that he didn't want to give his decision because it might, uh, if publicised, affect the jury's decision in the Keogh case. And it did. Of course it did. Worse still, the former DPP, the then Attorney General Trevor Griffin, and many others in the system were at the time already well aware of serious criticisms of Dr Manock's work in a number of other earlier cases, but seemed to have taken no action. I think the main problem with expert evidence is that lay jurors tend to take it as gospel. But at the end of the day, very few juries, I think, feel competent to embark upon their own assessment of uncontradicted um, expert evidence. Of course, for Keogh, this had catastrophic consequences. All too obvious now that there's overwhelming expert agreement that the evidence Dr Manock put to the jury was scientifically unsound. The so-called thumb bruise on Anna Jane Cheney's inner left calf, which the DPP told the court revealed how she was killed and completed what he believed was 
the one positive indication of murder, namely the grip mark on the bottom of the leg. Almost certainly never existed. I think there would be very few of any pathologist in Australia who would go to court and say this means the leg was gripped by hand. And the material that, uh, of this, from this specimen that's looked at under the microscope shows minimal, if any, bruising at all. In my opinion, there is very little evidence of that in the sections that was examined down the microscope. Even those state pathologists who gave prosecution evidence in the two Keo trials have now confirmed their microscopes too could see no sign of bruising. Dr Ross James told a recent medical inquiry... Down the microscope, I can't convince myself that that's not the description of a bruise. And the author of the grip theory itself, former chief pathologist Dr Colin Manock, has finally admitted he couldn't find it either. So we looked at it, thought it might be a bruise, put it under the microscope, couldn't find any scientific evidence of a bruise, but said it was a bruise anyway. That's correct. Against all scientific practice, Dr Menock simply chose to push his grip theory based only on what he thought he'd seen with his naked eye, an approach even his close colleague Dr James asserted was... So imprecise as to be almost useless. And so the jury was led on in blind faith that there was genuine science behind what they were being told. In fact, the only evidence of the phantom bruise was supposedly captured in these grainy black and white images. Photos which Professor Gail Spring, an expert in forensic photography, tells us are themselves of almost no evidentiary value whatsoever. It's not to say black and white can't be used for certain uh, specialist things, but as a general recording medium, color photography, uh, uh, either in transparency or in negatives, uh, is, a, is an international standard. And for something such as bruising, uh, would it seem self-evident to use colour? In any kind of photograph where colour uh, might identify um, what it is, how, uh, possibly even how old it is or what shape it is, uh, precisely, colour film is, is actually quite crucial to that. However, what's now equally disturbing is the lengths governments seem to have gone to since to excuse these and other obvious shortcomings in the prosecution case. On April 1st, 2003, our Attorney General, Michael Atkinson, went public, attempting to prop up the flimsy photographic evidence with this astonishing claim. In 1994, it was policy of the State Forensic Science Centre to take only black and white photographs. Therefore, it is quite wrong to suggest that the use of black and white photographs was a poor technique. It was good practice. Surely, he couldn't have been serious. I've never heard of such a policy and it sounds ridiculous because obviously even to the most inexperienced layman a colour photograph must be much more valuable than a black and white photograph so if there's such a policy it's a policy grounded in folly. It's not just the jury but now the public too who have not been told the whole story. I've been in uh, forensic uh, and in, in pathology for, uh, well, since 1976, and I've never known anything other than using colour. So just who was in the AG Michael Atkinson's apparently eager ear saying a black and white only policy was in force until just 10 years ago? It would seem those closely linked to the case. Dr Ross James? Photographs were taken in black and white, which was usual in our department at that time. And the former DPP, Paul Rove. I mean, it may be that the, their funding didn't extend to colour photography, I don't know. I mean, there could be any number of reasons why the colour photographs weren't been taken at that time. But did such a policy ever exist? Not if you check the evidence. Bear in mind, and the AG should have known this, aside from their own staff, the state's pathologists also had access to the photographic services of the SA police, who for many years have used colour. If we go back to 1989, for instance, and the Black Deaths in Custody Royal Commission, the same Dr Manock, in doing the autopsy of Kingsley Richard Dixon, ordered copious colour photographs be taken, particularly to record bruising. In fact, the Royal Commissioner in his report noted... Comprehensive coloured photographs were taken during the autopsy procedures. 
which enable me to accept Dr. Manick's finding, particularly as to bruising or the lack of bruising. We then searched back over numerous other cases and found the use of colour was commonplace. Take, for instance, the case of Derek Bromley, convicted of murder back in 1984. Itself, a possible miscarriage of justice in which Dr. Manock again played a key role. What are the photos in the Bromley case of? Well, they were photographs of the bruising and the injuries. In colour? Of course, yes. And that would have been, what, 10 years before the Keogh case? That's correct, yes. And who would have ordered the taking of those photos? Well, it must have been Dr. Manock because he was the pathologist in the case. And there's many, many more examples. The Gerald Warren autopsy, colour photographs. The Peter Wilson autopsy, more colour photographs. The baby deaths cases of the early 90s, also colour. And the black deaths cases of Bronte Ware and Stephen Webster in 1991 also involved the taking of colour autopsy photographs. There must be lots of people though, police, defence lawyers, prosecutors, pathologists, even judges, who knew what the real situation was, but have remained silent. Well, yes, wouldn't you think that some amongst them, even one amongst them, would have thought it appropriate to put the record straight? While the silence isn't sinister, it certainly hasn't helped. Former Adelaide Uni law professor Bob Moles has just published a book called Losing Their Grip, which provides a detailed analysis of all of the elements in the Keogh case. If people read the book and understood the facts that it actually happened in the Keogh case and compared that to the story that they had been told, they would be horrified. But to be doubly sure of the accepted practice regarding colour photography, we wrote to forensic science centres around the country. Without exception, colour photographs at autopsies was deemed essential, absolutely essential in homicide cases, indispensable, very valuable, and the use of colour became more or less obligatory in the late 1970s to mid-1980s. Good practice, or best practice, would be take the colour photographs first with a scale, then take a black and white photograph. But you would never take a black and white photograph instead of a colour photograph. We then wrote to Dr Hilton Cobus, the Director of Forensic Science SA, twice, and while he dodged the question about a black and white only policy, he did say... Forensic science of Australia photographic records indicate that a transition to colour photography at autopsies occurred in the second half of 1994. However, when we referred this to internationally respected pathologist Professor Derek Pounder, who worked at the Adelaide Forensic Science Centre during the 1980s, he immediately disputed it. I have colour slides of bodies autopsied at the Forensic Science Centre taken during my time there by the Forensic Science Technician in the early 1980s. Incidentally, the centre boss, Dr Cobus, in the same year as Keogh, admitted in court his lab had bungled crucial evidence in the NCA bombing case. No one has ever been convicted of that awful crime. We also wrote to the Attorney General twice about the so-called photo policy, but he simply failed to reply. The question the public must ask now is why, if the Keogh conviction was sound, would the authorities need to be so defensive about what was done? How much confidence can the public have in what they're being told? And to add further to the injustice, the Attorney General's lawyer, Chris Caracas QC, has had Henry Keogh's petitions on his desk for an incredible three and a half years. This represents 15% of his entire sentence. Given the evidence of the um, lack of proper uh, credentials of the pathologist and the uncertainty about his scientific approach, I would have thought that that could have been dealt with in a matter of three months. There's nothing very complex about the situation. As an Attorney General, Michael Atkinson has displayed such distaste for the case, the top QCs say he should disqualify himself from playing any further role. Do you think in this case it would be better if it went to an independent arbiter? I think that's probably uh, a valid point. 
almost certainly the person who's called upon inevitably to make the decision as to whether it go back is a politician. They've appointed judges, they've appointed prosecutors, and they have, one might think, at least in the public perception, some vested interest in uh, maintaining the status quo. That is, that the convic conviction be retained. In fact, Keogh's barrister, Kevin Borick QC, has decided enough is enough. Not only has there been an inexcusable three and a half year delay, but we've now got an election coming up. We don't know who the Attorney General will be next week. We now have to pursue the only other option available to us, and that is to ask the Court of Criminal Appeal to reopen the case. That's a very difficult task. With the growing number of eminent voices speaking out, Keogh now represents a test of whether the new government has any genuine commitment to justice. So far in this case, the Rand government has failed miserably. But then we'd be happy to be proven wrong. What you've got in Keogh now is some very, very well credentialed expert evidence which casts enormous doubt on the very fundamentals that convicted Keogh. And in my view, that is the sort of case, it's the archetypal case to go back before the court. Well, if you'd like to have your say on the case, here's your chance. The question, do you think Premier Mike Rann should instigate an immediate independent review of the Keogh case? To vote yes, please call 1902 557704. To vote no, please call 1902 557705. Or you can also cast a vote on our website. After the break, the acne treatment getting incredible results.